We're going to read the second half of verse 26, and we will read through verse 28. The second half of Hebrews 9, 26 through verse 28. Would you please stand with me and we will read this blessed text. This is the word of God. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Holy Father, we have spent a season in prayer. I pray that thy spirit is moving in the hearts of each of thy dear children here. Help us to break off with the distractions of the day, the crusts and the barnacles of the world, the assaults of the flesh, of the world and of the devil. Lord, may our hearts and minds be free to hear Thee. Help this poor vessel of dust. Father, grant me the grace to preach by life-giving power. May it all be to Thy eternal glory and the good of Thy people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. I'm going to die. And so are you. Do you ever think about that? Or do you, like American religion, do everything you can not to think about that? I am going to die. And so are you. The text that we've just read makes the point as clearly as human language can convey it. It is appointed unto men once to die. According to the New Oxford American Dictionary, one of the definitions of the word appointment is an arrangement, an arrangement to meet someone at a particular time and place. Well, that's exactly what our verse is telling us. And it's exactly what God is telling us in his inspired and infallible word. There's an arrangement that has been made. And it's to meet the king of terrors, death, at a time and a place. Our lives are filled with appointments. Doctors, dentists, and medical testing appointments. Automobile, electronic, and appliance repair appointments. Hair, nail, and fitting appointments, accountant, tax, counseling appointments. The list is endless. We make appointments. We keep appointments. We cancel appointments. 
We reschedule appointments. We skip appointments. And sometimes we even forget appointments. But there is one appointment that you and I will keep. It will not be canceled, rescheduled, skipped, or forgotten. I am going to die. And so are you. You're a second, a minute, an hour, maybe not even a full day before your time comes. But you're closer to it now than you were when we began. We are in many ways rushing toward it without realizing it. God has scheduled the appointment and we will not be early, we will not be late. Except for those who are alive when Jesus Christ returns in all his splendor and glory, all of us, all human beings, children, middle-aged, old, going to die. Hundreds of thousands have died in this pandemic. And the death count isn't finished yet. And without the pandemic, tens of thousands of people drop out of this life every single day. The vast majority of them not having the slightest notion of the importance of that appointment. And they drop out of this life into eternity without Christ. I repeat, it is appointed unto man once to die. You didn't make the appointment. I didn't make the appointment. Almighty God, who governs our lives, has made it. In the Bible, death is sometimes called the king of terrors. That king stalks every one of us. You have a stalker. He's coming. And the day will come, thankfully, that the King of Kings will send the King of Terrors to us and will keep our appointment. Our message is entitled the inescapable appointment. May God, our Heavenly Father, shower us with the Holy Spirit, with a holy sobriety and solemnity, with ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts of faith to bow and believe. May the Spirit of God grant us a glimpse of our precious Savior that we might love and adore Him above everyone and everything. Otherwise, death will be a shock to us that we did not expect. Now, with that in mind, let us consider three things from this rich text. The first is in the second half of verse 26. Jesus Christ came into the world to put away sin. This sacred text says, Now, 
once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now you will notice the words. In the end of the world he hath appeared. Not will appear. Now that's the way most people hear the words end of the world. This has nothing to do with the future. This is past tense. In our day, when people hear that phrase, the end of the world, they usually think in terms of Jesus' second coming and the day of judgment. However, the apostles who wrote the scriptures understood that the last days, the end of the world, is the period between the life and death of Jesus Christ and His second coming. That is the end of the world. We're in the last days. And that means we have been in the last days for 2,000 years. As a matter of fact, the epistle to the Hebrews begins, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. These last days. So, in the end of the world, Jesus appeared... And he appeared to put away sin. To put it away. What a beautiful thought. For those of us that struggle and wrestle with the ravages of indwelling sin. <clears throat> the thought that it's put away. Is pure joy. Now. <clears throat> Jesus appeared, it says, to put away sin. How did he do that? How did he do that? The eternal Son of God became man. Eternal Son. Deity. Almighty, all-knowing. All-present. Infinite, eternal the Son of God, gloriously in fellowship with the Father and with the Spirit through all eternity. There was a love in community that was unbroken, pure, holy, unthinkably good, kind, glorious. Not a spot, not a stain of sin. The love between the Father and the Son is set before us in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That phrase, the Word was with God, the Greek there is beautiful. It, it, the picture with it is face to face. It means a relationship, a loving, glorious Spotless, unspeakably, unthinkably, clean, pure, holy. That son came into this world. The most extraordinary man that ever has been or ever will be walked this planet. Born of a virgin, by the miracle of the Holy Spirit in the virgin's womb, the eternal Son of God took full humanity to Himself. Fully God, fully man, in one person. Jesus Christ, the God-man, appeared. Before the foundation of the world, God purposed to save His people from their sins. The glorious covenant of redemption between the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the glorious eternal plan to save His people from their sins is why Jesus appeared. 
and appear he did history was never the same after he came into this world he lived he pursued his preaching and miracle ministry and then he offered himself as the sin-bearing substitute of his people he sacrificed himself as we have seen for several lord's days now he sacrificed himself he was the great priest offering up the acceptable sacrifice he gave himself into the hands of his enemies who abused, tortured him, and crucified him. Why did he give himself to that? Now most here know the answer. But how often do you think about it in the light of the inescapable appointment that you're going to keep? Is it just theology that floats in our head? Something that gives us a little religious itch that we can scratch once in a while? Or is it the very heart and soul of our lives that we hold on to every day knowing that our God could call us out of the world at any moment? We often do not use our theology the way God gave it to us. And why he gave it to us. We don't use it for the, the things that we should. What we usually do is become fat-headed. <clears throat> we become almost useless to other people. Other than people who have read as many books as we have. And we can sit around and we can argue about who are the real people of God and who are not. While most of the time the real people are out there living and giving their lives to serve the, the Lord Jesus. Theology was never meant to float in our head like a wasted bee. It was meant to put fire in your bones. It was meant to fill you with awe, reverence, and worship. And to give you a hope in this world, regardless of how your spouse acts, or whether your children become faithful or not, or whether you lose that sweet job that you had. Your theology, proper biblical theology, devoured, prayed over, meditated in, stamped upon the soul, gives us strength for the inescapable appointment and prepares us for it. The Bible tells us that human beings have broken God's law and are worthy of God's severest judgment. Spiritual, physical, spiritual, and eternal death. Now that's the way the scriptures speak of death. There's more than one kind. I trust you understand that. What our nation is either caught up with in a morbid sense and in loving its bloodthirsty violence or constantly trying to avoid, don't want to think about it. We don't think of death as ugly. As a matter of fact, death hardly ever looks ugly to us because we pay thousands upon thousands of dollars to make a corpse look as decent as we can. But there is death, more than one kind of death, but they're all related. Physical death is the separation of our soul from our body. It's not about brain death. That's a modern invention. Primarily for harvesting organs. The scriptures always talk about the soul separating from the body. The idea of death is separation. Soul from body. And then spiritual 
Death is the separation of our soul from God's favor, from God's goodness. It's why we die physically. And eternal death is the separation of our soul and our body from God's grace, mercy, and love for eternity. We're, not, we're never out of His presence. One of the things that will make hell so horrifying is that God's there. But there will be not one drop of grace, mercy, love, peace, just the ever-present knowledge that I am a rebel against this God. I hate Him and I cannot escape Him. The Son of God became a man to be the sacrifice for the sins of His people. Jesus kept God's law in the place of His people. And since God's broken law demands the death penalty, Jesus was crucified and died in the place of His people. He gave Himself to put away sin. God poured out all the judgment for all of the sins of His people upon His pure, holy, darling Son, both in body and soul. The Scriptures declare, for the wages of sin is death. And if we die without Christ, we will have embraced in this world and the world to come all the categories of death. Spiritual, physical, and eternal. And there's no escaping it. God has appointed. God has appointed death. Jesus, in the place of his people, that's how he put away sin. By the sacrifice of himself. All the guilt, all the shame, all the punishment for our sins fell on him. Either he died for our sins or we will die in our sins. There is no escaping the penalty for sin. That's why we're going to die physically even when we're born of God's Spirit. Thankfully, Jesus not only died for our sins, but God imputes Jesus' righteousness to all that repent of their sins and believe on Him to believe on that crucified and resurrected Lord of glory, to believe upon the Son of God who became man so that He could die. If we believe on Christ, all our crimes against heaven are gone and we have a new title, Righteous. Well, Jesus gave himself. He put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. That brings us to our second thought. Much more could be said about the first. The second one is this. All people will die and then face judgment. It's appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. It doesn't stop with the idea of ceasing to exist. Now that's what, that's what uh, modern science tells us. Uh, this is what modern medicine tells us. Oh, death. Oh yes, death. <clears throat> it's just a part of life. 
And we're going to conquer that one of these days. We'll, we'll figure out all the right medications. We'll figure out all the right chips. We'll, we'll upload our brains into silicone heaven. No. That's a demonic delusion. It's appointed unto men once to die. And then the judgment. In other words... There is something about us that lives past death. That consciously will stand before God in judgment. We don't just cease to exist and that's it. So party it up now. Let's hear that text once more. It's appointed unto men once. Appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. In the text, the Greek word translated appointment, appointed, means that something is unavoidable in view of inevitable circumstance. That sounds like a dictionary, doesn't it? But it's it's right on the money. It's explaining to us. It's defining for us the idea of this appointment. It's unavoidable. It's unavoidable. Inescapable. In view of inevitable circumstance. In other words, death is inescapable. Why? Because God appointed it. We are lawbreakers, rebels, sinners. And every one of those terms demands in God's world the death penalty. God, the Almighty, all-knowing, all-present Creator, the Sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, governs all things, including death. The details of our death are all part of God's eternal purpose. We might put it this way. God has planned the time, place, and means of your death and mine and he's marked it on his calendar before he created the world and no one changes God's calendar my wife and I try to stay in sync she has her calendar I have mine sometimes they're synced we have the same things on there and sometimes I miss and forget and don't put one down. And you miss something on the calendar. Sometimes it's just embarrassing or humiliating. Sometimes it's shameful. Sometimes it can have enormous consequences. But there won't be any fear of our missing what's on God's calendar. Not in the slightest. And I have looked at my calendar numerous times. I set it with an alarm so that if I'm if I have to prepare for a particular sermon or if I have to prepare for a conference or if I'm preparing for uh, uh, an an important occasion, it tells me I I always set it at least two weeks so that it tells me every day, you know, even then I've still missed some. But it, it'll come and it'll tell me two weeks before. And then the next, I'll say, snooze for a day. It'll come back. And I'll say, snooze for a day. And it'll come back. But it just keeps getting closer. I can't stop it from getting there. I might forget what I'm supposed to do on that day. But it's coming. And that is exactly the way it is with your death. The problem is, you don't know where it is on God's calendar. So you have to be ready for it. Now. Now. You will not die a year, 
a month, a week, a day, an hour, a minute, or a second before God's time. And then you will keep that appointment. Since our death is certain, how did physical, spiritual, and eternal death enter this world? Now, those of you that are adults know that. Many of you children, and I am telling you children this, uh, primarily for your uh, understanding. Physical, spiritual, and eternal death entered the world by one man, Adam. Those children that are here this evening, most of you know that. But we always want to make sure we get this. By one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. Children, have you lied to your parents? Death penalty. Have you disobeyed your parents? Death penalty. We could go on. Adults, you understand, do you not? Sins are not, oops, a mistake. Death came by sin. Death passed upon all men. I think one of the most sober moments, if I may share this, in my entire life was watching my beloved fellow elder take the coffin this size of his firstborn and lower it into the ground. The king of terrors comes at any age I don't know how many precious little ones we have lost to miscarriage in this congregation. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old. Don't listen to the devil's lie that you can play around with your life and then maybe later seek the Lord. Might happen. You might be gone tonight. It is appointed and you will not miss it. You will not miss it. Adam's sin is why we sin and is why we die. God, the giver and taker of life, demands the death penalty to all sin, every sin, one sin. Let's go a little further then. What is sin? Children, you've heard this. You need to hear it again. Adults, we always need to be reminded. It's every thought, word, and deed. Every thought, word, and deed outside the will of God. And that means... That there is none righteous, no, not one. That's what the scriptures tell us. Much as we love these children, as much as they give us joy and delight, there's not one righteous child here. Every one of you needs the Savior. Not only that, but all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no escaping death because we're all death worthy, we're all sinners. All it takes is one. And we've got tens of thousands, maybe millions. Treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. I used to teach in a school, church school. And I was doing the best I could to break all of the slang out of my vocabulary. 
the world I had lived in before was all about slang. And I was trying to learn, how, and I mumbled. Yeah, man, yeah, 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 how you doing? Yeah, yeah, cool. Right? <clears throat> I actually had to try to train myself to articulate words so that people could understand them. And I had the habit of saying, you know, you know, well, you know, about everything, you know. And I said, I've got to drop this, you know. <clears throat> and the children that I was teaching would laugh at me because I'd say, I'm really trying to stop this, you know. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to start dropping a nickel. into. I had, a, I had a, a Martin Luther pewter cup. And I said, I'm going to start dropping a nickel in this thing every time I say, you know. And you know what I did? <laughs> I said, you know. And I would say, I've got to stop this, you know. I, and I was having trouble quitting. And, and the children would laugh every time I'd go over and go, clink, clink. I was running out of change. And I'd be okay for about five minutes or so. And then I'd say, okay, let's open up our book. Today uh, we're doing history, you know. And I... I I was filling up the cup. I even had to go borrow some. Now, the more I did it, the more embarrassed I got, the more ashamed I got, because I was telling the children, I'm going to stop this, and I couldn't. I was having real trouble breaking that. And with every time, I was just treasuring up. That's every sin we're treasuring up before God. Clink, 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 and it doesn't stop. Until you fill up your cup and the Lord sends the king of terrors and your appointment comes. And if you have not repented of your sin, you will perish for eternity. You will die physically because you were dead spiritually and you will be in hell in what the scriptures call the second death forever. Treasuring up wrath. Every day, every day you're outside of Christ, you're building up the pile of your damnation and you're plunging yourself further into hell and especially children who have been brought up with the truth and go their own way. You stood in the light of eternity and walked away for the vomit and the fool's gold of the world. It's appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment you will treasure up your wrath and you will be everlastingly in misery now while my sins and your sins may not be the same every single child born in this congregation is a sinner and every adult is a sinner and we will follow and they will follow our hearts to sin unless God in his mercy grants us the grace to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin gives way to death, the king of terrors, and then the king of kings will judge. The king of terrors is nothing in comparison to the King of Kings. So unless, our, unless we repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus, we will be forever under God's judgment, which really comes under our next head. <clears throat> so, let me say, lastly, Jesus Christ is the sin-bearing sacrifice who is coming again. It's quite remarkable how often the book of Hebrews tells us about Christ and his sacrifice. 
It's glorious. It's beautiful. It's soul food. It's satisfying. It contents the hungry heart. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And as we've seen, that means that the eternal Son of God made flesh was beaten, was spat upon, was crowned with thorns, was scourged with whips, and nailed to the cross for the sins of His people. Judgment day for God's people appears on the cross. That's why the Bible says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Watch people. Watch the way they live. Why do they live the way they do? Most of them are afraid, utterly fearful, scared to death. The thought of dying. They want to have as much fun as they possibly can before they cease to exist. The problem is they will never cease to exist. And all the partying will end in eternal misery. By dying physically, Jesus Christ won a perfect salvation. The pardon of sin and eternal life for those who were dead spiritually. Who through fear of death lived in bondage. Jesus Christ in his death sets us free. We don't fear death. Wake up. Don't fear a virus. Die for the glory of God if that's what his purpose is for you. The New Free Grace broadcaster has two articles at the end that are just astounding. They're all good. In fact, one of them even teaches you how to meditate on death. But the last two articles set the glory of Christ and of the world to come before us with such beauty, you want to die. I'm not kidding. You want to die. You want to be with Christ. You see, if you love the world, if your happiness is all wrapped up in your spouse, your children, your paycheck, your education, your looks, those are going to fade. Unless you've got a lot of money, you can make him hang around a little bit longer than somebody else, but that's it. All that's going to be gone. But I am telling you with all of my heart and all of my soul, if you love Christ above all, then you have a reason to die. A good reason to die. A good reason to look beyond the grave, look beyond the death, whichever death the Lord sends you, and to be looking and longing and hoping for the one that loved you before the foundation of the world. To love Him with all of your heart and soul and mind and to have nothing whatsoever in the highway of your heart to absolutely gush your love on the Lord Jesus. If you're living in the world, live to His glory. And one of the ways you do that is loving him above all things and all people. And if that's true, then you want to be with him. You want to see him. Oh, I know we have responsibilities here and I wouldn't want you to shirk a single responsibility. Love your children, care for them. But you know, the Lord takes mommies out sometimes. Doesn't he? He takes daddies out sometimes. They weren't done with their work. But the Lord said, yeah, you're finished. He takes children out sometimes. His way, his time, it's all on his calendar. It's real and it's coming. When it gets quiet in here, I hear this thing ticking. Doesn't get quiet in the pulpit very much. But the fact of the matter is, this is your life ticking away. Watch the hand. It's getting closer and closer to the moment you meet the king of terrors. 
We need to think about that. Now, that's not such a horrible thought if that we think behind the king of terrors is the king of kings. That one that loves me and that I love back. Well, it should be obvious everyone here knows how do we lay hold of Christ? By repentance and faith. Change your mind about the sins that damn you and look to the one who bore your hell on the cross. Unto him that look for him. Who's going to look for Jesus? Those that have met him in repentance and faith. Those who live with him day by day. Those who commune with him in prayer, in the word, in meditation. And as their lives bring in those truths and as the Holy Spirit stamps those truths and shapes the heart, our lives change and we walk with him and we love him. The more we walk with him, the more we want to be with him. Little in contemporary Christian music is attractive to me, but I had a friend who was in the biz and he wrote a song. And the chorus of it was, one day Jesus will call my name. <clears throat> and he tells us, he says, I want to get so close to him that it's no big change in the day that Jesus calls my name. Now, the change is going to be beyond anything we could ever possibly imagine. But that's the right way of thinking. I want to get so close to him. Now, there's no big change in the day that Jesus calls my name. All right? So the idea, brethren, is that death is not our friend. It is an enemy. But it is the Lord's servant. And when our days are done, he's going to bring us to himself. And that's why we're dying. Christ says, now, come home. Do you want to die? You should think about that question. Are you willing to die? Has the world so got its hooks in you that you just can't let go? Now, Jesus will set you free. Well, here's our last thing. How should you pray to get ready for death? Can you do that? Yeah, sure. Now, I borrow these thoughts here from Christopher Bogosh. His writings are very helpful. And he said, first, pray for clear evidence of salvation in Christ. That's the way you prepare for death. Self-examination. Do I know the Lord? Do I know the King of glory? Do I know the Savior? Do I know the one who shed his blood for sinners? Pray for clear evidence of salvation in Christ, the rock to which unshaken faith is cemented. Second, pray for the renewing of the inner man. Pray for the renewing of the inner man as this sinful outer man decays and it's decaying. For some, some of us, it's more apparent. The body's dying away. That's why I can say on one hand, I'm dying. And on the other hand, I'm going to die. And so will you. So are you and so will you. So you need to be praying that the inner man is renewed, that he's strengthened, built up. Prepared for the glorious resurrection body at the second coming. And thirdly, pray that, that, uh, that you will be equipped by God to face death without fear by believing in the mercy of Christ. Don't doubt Him. Someone who I know who is dying. I said, how are you doing? How are things going? He said, oh, the enemy... The enemy is taunting my soul. He's attacking me, vexing me day and night. You're not a Christian. You're not a Christian. 
Think about that sin you committed. Think about those words you said. You don't think the enemy, he's been doing that? You think he's going to go away while you're dying? Pray that you're ready. Pray that you're ready. It'll come the Lord's way. Because it's Christ calling you home. Or it's God's judgment and time to send you into perdition. So, we want Christ. We want to lay hold of Christ. We want to pray and always be ready. I want to close with a quote from Octavius Winslow. Quote, All this triumph, all this glory, all this joy we owe to Jesus' death and resurrection. Precious, too, because death is the end of all our sorrows. The end of all our sorrows and sufferings, their infirmities, their sicknesses, their sins. Wouldn't it be glorious never to sin again? It is the termination of all evil, the birthday of all good. You ever thought about that? The day of your death is the birthday of eternal goodness. No sin ever. The birthday of all good. Oh, precious death that dissolves the last link that binds me to corruption, that breaks the last fetter of sin, stifles the last groan, hushes the last sigh, dries the last tear, and introduces me to the sinless, sorrowless, companionship of those who are before the throne of God and the Lamb without fault. Oh, who with but the lowliest hope in Christ longs not, wearies not, sighs not to be there. How the contrast intensifies this yearning. Here is earth, there is heaven. Here is sin, there is purity. Here is toil, there is rest. Here is continual sorrow, there is fullness of joy. Here is exile, there is home. Are you ready to go home? Are you prepared to go home? Here are imperfect saints. There the spirits of just men made perfect. No church splits in heaven. No people angry with each other, angry with the elders, griping, complaining. No, perfected saints. Oh, oh, here are partings and changes. There, eternity restores the holy loves of earth, sanctifies and fixes them forever. Oh, pants not your spirit for the eagle's flight, that you may be there. Close quote. I'm going to die, and so are you. I pray that you realize the inescapable appointment is coming. The days are clicking off your calendar. If you know Christ, death is simply the door to the glory of eternity with the one who loves our souls. Don't fear it. So, you have an immortal soul, you can lose it. Your inescapable appointment is coming more quickly than you think. Repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of everlasting life. And pant for the world to come. Amen.
Holy Christ, we need Thee. But more than that, we want Thee. Lord, we long never to have a wicked thought again or utter a wicked or hurting word or do a foul and God-dishonoring thing. Lord, we want to honor Thee here while we're here. But Lord, fill our hearts with such a love for Christ that the things of this world grow dim and our souls pant for that glory to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please stand with me. <clears throat> now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. May we go panting for heaven.